Hello and welcome back to another episode of A Cozy Christmas Podcast. I'm your host, Art. Happy Valentine's Day. We are in the middle of February on the day of this recording. It is Valentine's Day itself. I hope you have had a good Valentine's Day. We have celebrated by having the stomach flu. (laughs) I will spare you details. So consequently, this episode is out a little bit late, but I thought maybe it would be not really on brand for a cozy Christmas podcast to have sounds of the stomach flu taking place in the background. So that's all I'll say about that. I'm happy to be back uh, as we head into now season three. How are you enjoying the reading challenge? If you are wanting to join in, no matter when you listen to this this year in 2022, head over to our Facebook page and uh, you will see posts every Wednesday uh, where we talk about what we're reading. You can find the reading prompts. Uh, Every month's reading prompt will be mentioned as well. So all that stuff will be linked on the Facebook page and also on uh, our website, CozyChristmasPodcast.com. So for this month's challenge, the reading prompt is The Grinch, to read a story that involves a redemption story similar to The Grinch or A Christmas Carol, but uh, that one's going to have a different prompt later in the year. Uh, You know the story where somebody understands the true meaning of Christmas or somebody goes through a significant change in their life. I picked a story I was going to read for the challenge. It sounded really interesting, but I got a couple of pages into it and it was just really awful. (laughs) This one just just wasn't for me. So I I set it aside and suddenly was scrambling. Oh, you know, what am I going to read? You know, it was already by this point, like February 5th or something. And I wanted to get going on it uh, because I have to record these things a little bit ahead of time, you know. Uh, Because I really wanted a Christmas book this month. I believe it was Glenn from the Seasons Eatings podcast uh, who had recommended me a couple of Christmas books last year, I think it was. And uh, one of them was Catherine Doyle's The Miracle of Ebenezer Street. And I, I read the blurb about it and thought, this book is perfect. Um, it tells the story of young George, whose mother died a couple of years ago. She died on Christmas Day, I think it was. So her, his father just completely shuts down emotionally, uh, which I can't say I blame him. I mean, that's tragic. Um, so, you know, not to criticize him. And this book doesn't criticize him for having those feelings, I don't, I don't think. But what he does is he allows his pain and his suffering to consume him. He basically cancels Christmas. He doesn't want any memory of his wife. They no longer celebrate Christmas. He's really become a Scrooge. And so the story is what happens when, when George finds a magic snow globe that sends he and his father on a series of adventures that may or may not help him find the joy in Christmas. I'll try not to give away any spoilers on this, but you should really, really read it. I listened to the audiobook and it was excellently done. But the whole point, uh, this whole story is that, you know, George, the young boy, is hurting, but so is his dad, Hugo. And Hugo eventually realizes that his pain and suffering, he's putting on his own son as well. Uh, so it's kind of, so sorry, a little bit of a spoiler, but that the journey is worth reading. Again, that book is called. The Miracle of Ebenezer Street. It's inspired by A Christmas Carol. Think of it as kind of a modern retelling for uh, a middle grade audience. And there are some fun, wacky characters that everyone will enjoy and some very real deep issues that are explored in the story. So, you know, I say it's middle grade, but there's some there's some deep themes in that story. So it does deal with with death of a parent, but it does it in a very tasteful and I think very thoughtful way. It's it's such a good read. Um, And I'm happily recommending that book this month uh, for you if you need a book to read 
to fill the prompt or put it on your Christmas TBR because it's, it's, uh, it's a good one. All right, I am in need for some new Christmas memories from you all. If you have a favorite Christmas memory, I'd love to hear from you. You can send me an email or reach out on any of my social media accounts. My email is cozychristmaspodcast at gmail.com. I would especially like to hear this month. um, I'll take, of course, any story, but I want to hear a story from you about your experiences with Santa Claus or one of Santa's helpers. In our story today that I'll be talking about here in a minute, uh, we, we deal with one of perhaps Santa's helpers, if not maybe the big guy himself. But you know those people who help Santa out by working at the mall and showing up in hospitals as uh, when Santa can't be there himself. They are very helpful to him. Do you have any fun experiences with mall Santas, with Santa's visiting a, a Christmas party or anything like that. Now, I've, I've told you stories already of my grandpa. He would dress up as Santa Claus. Usually when we were visiting for Christmas, he'd come out in his, in his Chris, Santa outfit and surprise us grandkids. You know, I remember, especially when I was younger, thinking, boy, he looks an awful lot like grandpa. Is it, is it? grandpa or is it Santa? You know, I, I, I really couldn't, you know, I just bought into the, into the excitement and it added, and, and as we get a little older, you know, we know, we knew it was grandpa, you know, he was helping Santa out and it was part of, of the fun, but it just was a little thing that added so much joy uh, to our Christmas time. Uh, I wouldn't trade those memories for the world. As I'm quickly approaching the age that I look like Santa. <laughs> I can't wait uh, to probably do something similar. I do remember a couple years ago on Halloween when wanted uh, we were gonna, taking the kids out to go trick-or-treating and I kind of was in the mood to wear a costume. So I have a t-shirt that looks like um, the top of Santa's shirt. You know, it's the red shirt with the white trim and he has a a naughty nice list coming out of his pocket. So it's a t-shirt. So I put that on over some warmer clothes and I had my Santa hat on, of course. Uh, but then I had this fake beard and it wasn't a nice, pretty Santa Claus beard, you know, white beard. It was kind of a dingy, stringy gray beard. Uh, think about like some of the beards on those guys from Duck Dynasty, I think is the show. I, I never watched the show, but you know, it's just long and scraggly and gross looking. So I put that on and I looked, I mean, I looked like a gutter Santa Claus, I think, but you know, what was fun is kids still recognize that, especially some of the little ones. They didn't care. I looked crusty. I mean, they were excited. They were like, Hey, it's Santa, Santa. And some of the adults thought it was pretty funny. Several of the adults, however, complained that it was too early for, to be thinking about Christmas that was <laughs> like, what do you mean? It's too early. It's, it's Halloween. Tomorrow's November. Get, get on board. <laughs> but that gave me a small taste of what it would be like to dress up as Santa. So I, I can't wait to, to have more opportunities to do that. I did in the process, I met a couple of people in town who, who really liked Christmas and they t- told me about some of their Christmas traditions of you know, one lady has a room that she collects all kinds of Christmas things and, she, and they're always set up on display. And um, so she said, whenever I'm in the mood, I just go up into the room and, and I can see all the Christmas stuff all in one room and it's there and it's, and it's just for me. And I thought that was neat. Another lady in town had already had her Christmas tree up because she was going to have, I think, like a knee replacement surgery or something and knew she wouldn't be able to get it up, uh, get the tree up after the surgery for quite some time. So she thought rather than not having a Christmas tree, she would just put it up on Halloween and have it up extra long. And that's the kind of logic I can get on board with. So yeah, let me know uh, if you have a funny story to tell about a mall Santa Claus, or maybe you saw Santa himself. 
that you stayed up on Christmas Eve and you caught a glimpse of him. Uh, I'd love to hear your story. So send that to me at uh, Cozy Christmas Podcast at gmail.com. For today's story time, uh, I'll be reading The Strange Adventure of a Wood Sled by Washington Gladden. This story is so cozy and such a wonderfully kind story. You're going to enjoy this one. I almost thought about waiting to read this until November or so. Such a Christmassy story, but I really needed something cozy today, so I'm going to read it. The story, as I said, was written by Washington Gladden. He was born on February 11th, 1836, and then he he died on July 2nd, 1918. He was a pastor in the uh, American Congregational Denomination. He was also an early leader in the social gospel, in which uh, the social gospel is, if I can understand it right, you know, it's this idea to apply Christian ethics to social problems for things like social justice and injustice, economic issues, racial issues. It's this idea that basically we are to care not just for the person's soul, but also for their physical needs, not just their spiritual needs, which I think it has very strong scriptural support, you know, that how are people going to listen to you talk about, you know, heaven if they're hungry and starving and have no home? How can we best show, you know, the love of, of God and the love of Jesus to those who are in need? Uh, Washington Gladden was one of the first people, or was an early leader in, in that movement. I was just reading through his entry in, in, on Wikipedia, so you can go there and read more about him. He sounded like a very interesting man. He also opposed uh, racial segregation, so that's good, <laughs> obviously. I point that out because you just you never know about some of these older writers. As you dig into some of their, their history and biographies, you come across things that um, as much as you like the writer or the stories, sometimes they're just a terrible person. Uh, or sometimes, to be fair, they're just following the the teaching of the time at uh, the time period, and they didn't know as much as we know today. But yeah, you can go and check out his uh, entry there on, on Wikipedia, including a delightful <laughs> picture. I got to share this picture of him because he's got this, it's a, it's a photograph and it's got this big bushy beard. Uh, he's looking stern and grouchy off into the distance, you know, and <laughs> not who I would have pictured to have written such a wonderfully charming, beautiful little Christmas story. So I'll be sure to share that picture because <laughs> it's it's hilarious. It tells the story of a family of a, a couple young children, and it sounds like a co- uh, some college age kids. They're they're all coming back home from school uh, for the Christmas holidays, and they're making their way home on a train at Christmas time in a snowstorm. What could possibly go wrong, right? <laughs> sure enough, the train gets stuck. Are they going to make it home? in time for Christmas? Will there be a Christmas miracle that happens? Perhaps by somebody who has a passing resemblance to Santa Claus? Well, we'll find out in our story today. So let's make ourselves cozy. If it's uh, still winter where you're at, maybe it'll be snowing outside and really add to the atmosphere of the story. Grab your favorite blanket, make yourself cozy, and I'll read you The Strange Adventures of a Wood Sled. By Washington Gladden. First published in 1879. Keeps coming right down, don't it, Bill? Bill could not deny it, and did not wish to admit it. Therefore, he said nothing. What was coming down was the snow. It had been falling, thicker and faster, ever since a little after daylight, and now it was nearly dark. Stumps of trees and gateposts were capped with great white masses of it. Here and there a path, cleared up to the back door of a farmhouse, showed on either hand a high bank of it fluted with broom or shovel. The boy, whose observation about its coming down I have just recorded, was Master Winfield Scott Burnham. 
He was a slender boy with a pale face, dark eyes, and brown hair. And he sat pressing his face against the pane of a car window, looking with rather a rueful countenance upon the fast falling snow. The young gentleman sitting opposite to him, whom he made bold to address as Bill, was his big brother, a junior in college, who had long been Wynn's hero. And he was worthy to be the hero of any small boy, for he was not only strong and swift and expert in all kinds of muscular sports, but he was too much of a man ever to treat small boys, even though they might be his own brothers, roughly or contemptuously. Across the aisle on the other side of the car sat Wynne's eldest sister, Grace, who was a sophomore at Smith College. In fronting her on the reversed seat was Wynne's younger brother, Philip Sheridan. The reason why these Burnhams happened to be traveling together was this. The Christmas vacation had come, and William and Grace were on their way to their home in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. The two small boys, whose school at home had closed a week earlier than the college's, had been visiting their cousins in Hartford for a few days, and it was arranged that William should come over from Amherst and join Grace at Northampton, and that the two should wait at Springfield for the little boys who were to be put on the northern train at Hartford by their uncle. But the trains on all the roads had been greatly delayed by the snow, and it was four o'clock before the noon express, with the Burnhams on board, left Springfield for the west. The darkness was closing in and the wind was rising, and William had already expressed some fear of a snow blockade upon the mountain. This remark had made Wynne rather sober, and he had been watching the snow and listening to the wind with an anxious face. How long shall we be going to Pittsfield? he asked his brother. There's no telling, answered Will. We ought to get there in two hours, but at this rate it'll be four at the shortest. Oh, that will make it eight o'clock, sighed Wynne. I'm afraid the Christmas tree will all be unloaded before that time. Yes, my boy, I'm sorry, but you might as well make up your mind to that. Wynne started across the car. This disappointment was too big for one. He must share it with Phil. Hold on, General, said William in a low tone. What's the good of telling him? Let him be easy in his mind as long as he can. Wynne sat down in silence. Phil was telling his sister great stories of the Hartford visit, and his gleeful tones resounded through the car. Grace was laughing at his big talk, and they seemed to be making a merry time of it. But the train had just stopped at Westfield, and there was difficulty in starting. The wind howled ominously, and great gusts of snow came flying down from the roof of the passenger house against the windows of the car. Presently, the two engines that were drawing the train backed up a little to get a good start and then plunged into the snow. The wheels were slipping upon the track and the train suddenly came to a halt. Back again they went a little farther for another start and this time the two engines, like two hearts that beat as one, cleared the course and the train went slowly on up the grade Grace and Phil had stopped talking, and they now came across and joined their brothers. "'Aren't you afraid that there may be trouble on the mountain, Will?' asked Grace. "'Shouldn't wonder,' said that gentleman shortly. "'But, Will, what in the world should we do if we should happen to be blockaded?' "'Sit still and wait till we were shoveled out, I suppose. You see, we couldn't go on afoot very well.' Going to be snowed up? That's tip-top, cried Phil. The boy's love of adventure had crowded out all thoughts of the festival to which they were hastening. I read in the paper about a train that was snowed up three or four days on the Pacific Road, and the passengers had jolly times. The station wasn't very far off, and they got enough to eat and drink, and they had all sorts of shows on the train. But I'd rather see the show at the Christmas tree tonight, said Wynne, than any show we'll see on this old train. Wouldn't you, Bill? Perhaps so, answered Bill. It was evident that he had reasons of his own for not wishing to be absent from the festival. Meantime, the train was plowing along. Now and then it came to a halt in a cut which the snow had filled, but a small party of shovelers that had come on board at Westfield usually succeeded, after a short delay, in clearing the track. Still, the progress was very slow. 
A full hour and a half was consumed between Springfield and Russell, and it was almost seven o'clock when the train stopped at Chester. The boys were pretty hungry by this time, and the prospect of spending the night in a snowbank was much less attractive, even to Phil, than it had been two hours before. At Chester, where there was a long halt, the passengers, of whom there were not many, nearly all got out and refreshed themselves. A couple of sandwiches, a piece of custard pie, a big round donut, and a glass of good milk considerably increased Phil's courage and greatly comforted Wynn, so that they returned to the car ready to encounter with equal mind the perils of the night. The snow had ceased to fall, but the wind was still blowing. Two or three more shovelers came on board, and thus, reinforced, the train pushed on. But it was slow work. The grade was getting heavier and the drifts were deeper every mile. But Middlefield was passed and Beckett was left behind, and at nine o'clock the train was slowly toiling up toward the summit at Washington, when, suddenly, it came to a halt, and a long blast was blown by the whistles of both engines. Shortly, a brakeman came through the train, and, taking one of the red lanterns from the rear of the last car, hurried down the track with it. "'Where is he going with that lantern?' asked Phil. "'He's going back a little way,' said Will. "'The lantern is a signal to keep other trains from running into us. "'That means that we are to stay here for some time. "'I'll go out and see what's up.' "'Presently he returned with a sober face and looking very cold. "'Well, what is it?' they all asked. "'Oh, nothing. "'There's a freight train in the cut just ahead of us "'with two of its cars off the track, "'and the cut's about half full of snow. "'If our Christmas goose isn't cooked already, "'there'll be plenty of time to have it cooked "'before we get out of this.' Is it that deep cut just below the Washington station? asked Grace. "Uh, The same, answered Will, and it's as likely a place to spend Christmas in as you could find anywhere in western Massachusetts. Can't they dig out the snow? cried Wynne. Oh yes, said the big brother, but it's not an easy thing to do. It's got to be done with shovels, and it will take a long time. How long? asked Grace, ruefully. Nobody knows but we shall be obliged to wait for more shovelers and wreckers to come up from Springfield, and I shouldn't wonder at all if we stayed here twenty-four hours. Can't you telegraph to father? I'm sorry to say I cannot. I asked about that, but the station man says the lines are down. Nope, there's nothing to do but bunk down for the night as well as we can and wait till deliverance comes. We're in a regular fix, and no mistake, and we've just got to make the best of it, replied Will. Just then the rear door of the car opened and a figure appeared that had not been seen hitherto upon the train. It was that of a stalwart man, perhaps fifty-five years old, with long white hair and beard, ruddy cheeks, and bright gray eyes. He wore a gray fur cap and a long gray overcoat, and looked enough like eh, somebody that we are all thinking of about Christmas time to have been that somebody's twin brother. "'Good evening, friends,' he said in a very jolly tone as he shut the car door behind him. Pleased to receive a call from so many on you. Merry Christmas to y'all. Tain't often that I can welcome such a big Christmas party as this to my place. The good nature of the farmer was irresistible. The passengers all laughed. I believe you, said a traveling salesman in a sealskin cap, and the sooner you bid us good riddance, the better we shall like it. And you needn't mind about wishing us many happy returns, either, said a black-whiskered man in a plaid ulster. If we ever get away from here, you won't see us again soon. What place is this? inquired a gray-haired lady, who sat just in front of the Burnhams. Washington's what they call it, said the jolly farmer. Poplar name enough, but the place don't seem to be over poplar just now with some of ye. And he laughed a big, jolly laugh. Is it like our capital, a city of magnificent distances? inquired the man in the Ulster. I reckon it is. It's considerable of a distance from everywhere else on earth, but it's nigher to heaven and any other place hereabouts. What is raised on this hill? inquired the traveling salesman. Oh, wind mostly. Is that article in your line? The laugh was on the salesman, but he enjoyed it as well as any of them. A bit of a girl about three years old, tugging a flaxen-haired doll under one arm, here came sidling down the aisle of the car. 
if you senty cloth, she said, lifting her great solemn black eyes to the farmer's face. The laugh was on him now, and he joined in it uproariously. Not just exactly, my little gal, he said, as he lifted her up in his arms, but you've come pretty nigh it. Sandy Ross is what they call me. Has you dot a flay and a waindeer? persisted the little maiden. No, but I've got a first-rate wood sled, pair of bobs with a wood rack on it, and as slick a span of Canadian ponies as you ever see. The farmer stroked the dark hair of the little girl with his great hard hand, and she snuggled down on his shoulder as if he had been her grandfather. The Burnhams had been joining in the merriment, though they had taken no part in the conversation. But when the little girl climbed down from the arms of Sandy Ross, Will arose and beckoned him to a vacant seat. How far from here do you live, Mr. Ross? Right up at the bank there. That's my house with a light in the window. It was a comfortable-looking white farmhouse with a sloping roof in the rear and a big chimney in the middle. Now, Mr. Ross, I live in Pittsfield, and I want mightily to get there before noon tomorrow. I don't believe this train will get there before tomorrow night. Could you take my sister and these two little chaps and me and carry us all home early tomorrow morning on your wood sled, providing it isn't too cold to undertake the journey? Let's see. Well, yes, I calculate I could. I was thinking about going over to Pittsfield tomorrow with a little jag of wood. I reckon live critters like you won't be no more trouble. Ho, 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 ho. The snow ain't no great depth. Taint nigh deep on to other side of the mountain than it is on this side. There'll be drifts now and then. But the fences is down so that we can turn into the fields and go round them. How long will it take you to drive over? Well, let's see. Taint over fifteen or sixteen mile. I reckon I can make it in three to four hours. Well, sir, if you'll get us over there safely before noon, I'll give you five dollars. All right, that's enough. Too much, I guess. But see here, my friends, just bring the young lady and the little chaps up to my house and spend the night there. All on ye. Then we can have an airly breakfast and start fair when we get good and ready. In less than five minutes, the Burnhams, with bags and bundles, were following Sandy Ross to the door of the car. This was the last night that our travelers saw of their fellow passengers on the Western Express. Late the next afternoon, the train rolled into Pittsfield Station, but the Burnhams were busy elsewhere about that time. It was but a few steps from the train to Sandy Ross's house. William carried his sister through the deepest snow, and the boys trudged along with the bundles, highly pleased with the prospect of an adventure in a farmhouse. Good Mrs. Ross was as blithe and hearty as her husband, and she soon made the young folks feel quite at home. To Miss Grace, the spire room, as Mrs. Ross called it, was assigned, while Will and the two boys found a sleeping place in the attic. The dim tallow candle that lighted them to bed disclosed all sorts of curious things. In one corner, facing each other, were two old, tall clocks that had long ceased ticking, and now stood with folded hands and silent pendulums, resting from their labors. An old chest of drawers that would have been a prize for hunters of the antique was near the clocks. Braids of yellow seed corn hung from the rafters, and at one end of the great room stood the hand loom on which the mother of Mrs. Ross had been wont to weave cloth for the garments of her household. It was an heirloom in the literal sense. The boys thought that this garret would have been a grand place to ransack, but they were too well-bred to go prying about and contented themselves with admiring what was before their eyes. It was not long before they were sound asleep in their snug nest of feathers, and when they waked the next morning breakfast was ready, and Farmer Ross and Brother Will had made all the preparations for the journey. To the excellent farmer's breakfast of juicy ham and eggs, genuine country sausages, and delicious buckwheat cakes with maple syrup. They all did full justice. Oh, it does me good to see boys eat, said the kind farmer's wife. They do enjoy it so. And tears were in her eyes as she thought of the hungry boys that used to sit around this table. Farmer Ross and his wife were alone in the world. Two of their sons were sleeping in unmarked graves at Chancellorsville. The other had died when he was a baby but they were not selfish people. They had learned to bear sorrow, and therefore their sorrow had not made them morose and miserable. It had only made them more kind and tender-hearted. 
Breakfast over, the wood sled came round to the door, and Mr. Ross looked in a moment to say a last word to his wife. You'd better make two or three pailfuls of strong coffee, mother, and boil three or four dozen eggs, and heat up a big batch of them air mince pies. The folks down here on the train will be mighty hungry this morning, and I've been down and told them to come up here in about half an hour and get what they want. Don't charge them nothing, let them pay what they've a mind to. Perhaps some of them ain't nothing to pay with, and they'll need it just as much as the rest. We mustn't let folks starve that get storm stayed right at our front door. And now, all aboard for Pittsfield. The hearty thanks and farewells to good Mrs. Ross were soon said, and the Burnhams bundled out of the kitchen into the wood sled. It was a long rack with upright stakes from a frame and held together by side rails, through which the ends of the stakes projected a few inches. A sideboard, about a foot in width, had been placed within the stakes on either side, and the space so enclosed had been filled with clean oat straw. Miss Grace wrapped Mrs. Ross's heavy blanket shawl around her sealskin sack. Each of the two little boys did himself up in a blanket. William robed himself in his traveling rug, and they all sat down in the straw, two fronting forward and two backward, and placed their feet against four hot flat irons wound in thick woolen cloth and laid over together in a nest between them. Over their laps a big buffalo robe was thrown, and Farmer Ross heaped the straw against their backs. Away they went, shouting a merry goodbye to the farmer's wife, secure against discomfort, and happy in the hope of reaching home in time for their Christmas dinner. Down in the railroad cut they saw the shovelers and the wreckers toiling at the disabled freight cars, but not much stir was visible about the express train that lay a little farther down the track. The snow did not appear to be very deep, and the ponies skipped briskly along with their light load. Here and there was a bare spot from which the snow had been blown, but not many drifts were found, and these were easily avoided, as Mr. Ross had said, by turning into the open fields. Farmer Ross was as blithe as the morning. From his perch on a crossboard of the wood rack, he kept up a brisk talk with the group in the straw behind him, Fire enough in the stove? he asked. Tain't often that you have a stove like that to sit around while you go sleigh riding. All right, sir. It's warm as toast, said Wynne. Genuine base burner, isn't it? I I should think your feet would be cold sitting up there, said Grace. Oh, no, not in this weather. Sides, if they do get cold, I knock them together a little, or else get off and run afoot a spell, and they're soon warm again. Do you often go to Pittsfield? asked William. Yes, every month or so. Generally do my trading there. Take along a little something to sell commonly, a little jag of wood or a little butter or a quarter of beef or something. I meant to have gone down last week and I had a big pile of Christmas greens I meant to take along to sell, but I was hindered and couldn't go. There's the greens now, all piled up in the age of the wood. I'd got them all ready, afraid they won't be worth much next Christmas. Oh, Mr. Ross, cried Grace, would it be very much trouble for you to put that nearest pile of them on the back part of the sled? I can find use for them at home, I know, and I should like to take them with me ever so much. Certainly, no trouble at all. And in two or three great armfuls, the pile of beautiful coral pine was heaped upon the sleigh. The morning wore on toward nine o'clock, and as the sun rose higher, the air grew warmer. The roads were steadily improving, and the ponies trotted along at a nimble pace. The boys began to be tired of sitting still. I'm not going to burrow up in this straw any longer, said Wynne. I'm going to get up and stir about a little. So am I, said Phil. It was easy enough to stand on the sled while it was in motion. In rough places the boys could take hold of the rail of the wood rack, and even if they fell it did not hurt them. Pretty soon Wynne, who had an artist's eye, began to pull out long vines of the evergreen and wind them round the stakes of the wood rack. I say, Phil, he cried, if we only had some string, we could fix this old frame so that it would look knobby. Well, here's your string, said Will, producing a ball of twine from his overcoat pocket and tossing it to his brother. I put that in my pocket by mistake when I tied up my last package yesterday morning and have been wishing it in Amherst ever since. Jolly, shouted Wynne. Now, Mr. Ross, you'll see what we'll make of your wood sled. Going to make a kind of Cinderella coach on it, hey? 
Well, go ahead. I shan't be ashamed on it, no matter how fine you fix it. The boy's fingers flew. This was fun. Before long, all the stakes were trimmed, and the spiral wreath of the evergreen had been run all round the side rail of the rack. It really began to look quite fairy-like. William and Grace first laughed at the fancy of the boys, and then began to aid them with suggestions. And presently William was up himself, helping them in their work. Twine wound with the evergreen was run diagonally across from the top of each stake to the bottom of the nearest one, and the wood rack began to look very much like what the poets call a wild wood bower. All it needed was a roof, and this was soon supplied. William borrowed Mr. Ross's big jackknife, leapt from the sleigh, and cut eight willow rods, and they were speedily wound with the evergreen. Then the ends were made fast with twine to the railing of the rack on either side, and, arching overhead, they completed the transformation of the wood sled into a moving arbor of evergreens. The boys danced with merriment. Isn't it just gay? cried Phil. I never dreamed that we could make it look so pretty. We couldn't have done it either, said Wynne, if Bill and Grace hadn't helped us. But what will the fellows say when they see us riding down the street? What I'm most curious to see, said Will, is the faces of Mr. and Mrs. Burnham and Baby Burnham when this gay chariot drives up to their door. They're worried about us powerfully by this time, and I reckon we've a jolly surprise in store for them. I hope they will not be as badly frightened, said Grace, as Macbeth was when he saw Burnham Wood coming. Pretty good for Sis, laughed William. What's the joke? inquired Wynne. Too classic for small boys. You'll have to get up your Shakespeare before you can appreciate it, answered the big brother. Appears to me, now put in the charioteer from his perch, that a rig as fine as this ought to have a little finer coachman. I ain't ashamed of the sled, as I said, but I do think I ought to be fixed up a little mite to match. You shall be, cried Grace. Here, boys, help me wind a couple of wreaths. Very soon, two light, twisted wreaths of evergreen were ready, and Mr. Ross, with great laughter, threw them over each shoulder and under the opposite arm, so that they crossed before and behind like the straps that support a soldier's belt. Then his fur cap was quickly trimmed with sprays of the evergreen that rose in a bell crown all round his head. Their journey was almost done. How quickly the time had passed. Every few rods they met sleigh loads of people, happy because Christmas and the slain had come together, and bent on making the most of both. These merry-makers all looked with wonder upon our travelers as they drew near, and answered their loud shouts of Merry Christmas with laughter and cheers. They had not gone far through the streets of the village before their kite had considerable tail. Just what it meant the small boys did not know, but if this driver was not Santa Claus, he was somebody equally good-natured, for he bowed and laughed right and left in the jolliest fashion to the salutations of the boys, and as many of them as could get near hitched their hand sleds to his triumphal car. Miss Grace was hidden from sight by the evergreens, and she enjoyed the sport of the boys almost as much as they did. Meantime, the hours were passing slowly at Mr. Burnham's. The father and mother had been too anxious about their children to sleep much during the night. They could get no word from the train after it left Chester, and the delay and uncertainty greatly distressed them. Mr. Burnham had just returned from the station with the news that the wires were up, and that the train had been heard from in the cut just beyond the summit, where it was likely to be kept the greater part of the day. "'Oh, dear,' cried the mother. "'I cannot have it so. Can't we get at them in some way? I'm afraid they will suffer with hunger. Then we had counted so much on this Christmas.' and the children's fun is all spoiled. Think of them sitting all this blessed holiday, cooped up in those dreadful cars, waiting to be shoveled out of a snowdrift. It seems as if I should fly. I wish I could. Well, my dear, said Mr. Burnham, soberly, I am sorry that the holiday is spoiled, but I see nothing that we can do. We can trust William to take good care of them and bring them all home safely, and we've got to be patient and wait. Just then the heads of the ponies were turning in at the gate of the wide lawn in front of the house. The small boys who were following unhitched their hand sleds, and the escort remained outside the gate. Drive slowly, said William. 
give them a good chance to see us coming. Baby Burnham was at the window. Santa Claus, she cried. Look, Papa, look. What does the child see? said Mr. Burnham, going to the window. Sure enough, baby. Do come here, my dear. What fantastical establishment is this coming up our driveway? It's a bower of evergreens on runners, and an old man with a white beard and a white coat all trimmed up with greens sits up there driving. He seems to be shaking with laughter, too. What can it mean? Just then, the wood sled came alongside the porch, and suddenly, out from between the garland sled stakes, four heads were quickly thrust, and four voices shouted, Merry Christmas! The children, bless their hearts! In a minute more, father and mother and baby and the jolly travelers were all very much mixed up on the porch, and there was a deal of hugging and kissing and laughing and crying, while Farmer Ross, on his own hook, or rather on his own wood sled, was laughing softly and crying a little, too. What made him cry, I wonder? Presently, Mr. Burnham said, But, Will, you haven't made us acquainted yet with your charioteer. It is Mr. Ross, father. He took us into his house in Washington Mountain last night and treated us like princes, and this morning he has brought us home and helped us in the heartiest way to carry out our fun. Mr. Ross, we are greatly your debtors, said Mr. Burnham. You have relieved us of a sore anxiety and brought us great pleasure. Well, I don't know, said the farmer. I didn't like to think of these here children being kept away from home on Christmas Day. And if I've helped them in any way to have a good time, why, God bless them. I don't think there's any better thing than an old man like me could be doing on such a day as this. Just here, Mr. Burnham's coachman came around the corner in great haste. Well, Patrick, what is it? said his master. The shafts of the sleigh, bad look to him, is broke, yonner, and I don't see how I'll ever get them baskets carried around at all. Oh, those baskets, cried Mr. Burnham in distress. Our Christmas baskets haven't been delivered yet, and it's almost eleven o'clock. The storm and our worry about you kept us from delivering them last night, and we have hardly thought of them this morning. I'm afraid those poor people will have a late Christmas dinner. Baskets of stuff for poor folks' dinner, said Farmer Ross. Let me take them around. Oh, yes, father, shouted Wynne. Let Phil and me go with him. The baskets are marked, aren't they? It'll be jolly fun to deliver them out of this sled. In a minute, the baskets, half a dozen of them, were loaded in, and within half an hour, they were all set down at the homes to which they were addressed. Poor old Uncle Ned and Aunt Dinah hobbled to the door and took in their basket with eyes full of wonder at the strange vehicle that was just driving from their doors. The widow Blanchard's children, playing outside, ran into the house when they saw the ponies coming, but speedily came out after their basket and carried it in, firm in the faith that they had had a sight of the veritable Santa Claus. To all the rest of the needy families, the gifts, though late, were welcome, and the bright vision of the evergreen bower on runners brought gladness with it into all those lowly homes. Farmer Ross went back with the boys to their home, his ponies were taken from the sled and given a good Christmas dinner in Mr. Burnham's stable. He himself was constrained to remain and partake of the feast that would not have been eaten but for him, and that lost none of its merriment because of him. And at length, about three o'clock in the afternoon, the Christmas car, stripped of its bravery but carrying some goodly gifts to Mrs. Ross, started on its return to Washington Mountain. My little friends who read this story will be glad to know that the Christmas festival at the church had been deferred on account of the storm from Christmas Eve to Christmas evening, so that the Burnhams had a chance to assist at the unloading of the Christmas tree. They will also guess that Farmer Ross's house and his barn and his orchard and his pasture and his woods and his trout brook and his blackberry bushes and his dog and his ponies and his cows and his oxen and his hens and pretty nearly everything that was his had a chance to get very well acquainted with Wynne and Phil during the next summer vacation. It will be a long time, I am sure, before the Rosses and the Burnhams cease to be friends, and before any of them will forget the strange adventures of a wood sled. I read this story for the first time last year, I think 2021 sometime, and I was just immediately hooked it was cozy. Uh, it was so atmospheric. It had 
you know, a classic Christmas trope that we're on the way home for Christmas break and, you know, we, we run into a snowstorm in, in the train or, or the, that we're, they're traveling in is stuck in the snow. How are we going to get home in time for Christmas? And a Christmas miracle happens. And I, I love it. Mr. and Mrs. Ross in this story are just such wonderful people that I, I love characters like this where they are kind and good and giving and they do what's right in spite of the sorrow that they've had in their life. That uh, one portion of that paragraph as they were eating around the dinner table, uh, it mentioned that two of their sons were sleeping in unmarked graves at Chancellorsville. Um, so they have lost two sons in the Civil War. Then another had died when he was a baby. That in spite of all this pain, they were not selfish people. It says they had learned to bear sorrow, and therefore their sorrow had not made them morose and miserable. It had only made them more kind and tender hearted. And what a great lesson that can be for us to, to turn our sorrow into actions of kindness and tenderheartedness. You know, and I think that's going to look different for everyone. That instead of allowing the hurt to consume us, we turn it around and do what's good. But I like how Farmer Ross and his wife don't let their sorrow, their genuine sorrow, destroy them and cut them off from life. They become even more kind and tenderhearted. And that's at times uh, a lesson that tragedy and heartache can teach us. Uh, it teaches us to be more tenderhearted and more kind. Good lesson for us. I think this one has got to be one of my favorite ones I've read so far. And I don't think I would have found it if it weren't for <laughs> this podcast. So thank you all for listening and uh, for wanting to hear these stories because I am finding some great ones like this, some real gems. This is, I think, one I might revisit every year or so. It's, it's, a, it's a good one. All right, that'll do it for me today. I will see you next time. Be sure to reach out if you have a Christmas story you'd like to share, a memory, a tradition, Whatever, email me at cozychristmaspodcast at gmail.com and I will uh, feature your memory on an upcoming episode. Also, if you would be so kind as to uh, leave a rating and review for the podcast that helps us out so much for uh, more people to find us, to share, uh, if you like this episode, to share it on your social media for uh, all of your family and friends who might like to listen to Christmas during the middle of the year. And who wouldn't want to do that? If you'd like to help support the show in a financial way, uh, there are some links in the show notes. You can donate at uh, ko-fi.com. That's ko-fi.com backslash cozy Christmas. And for uh, even the amount of, and for a $3 donation or more, uh, I will send you a Christmas card and a bookmark uh, as my way of saying thank you. So until next time, I hope that you will be kind and tender-hearted towards those in need. And remember that there is nothing in the world so irresistibly contagious as laughter and good humor. Have a very Merry Christmas.